so we are at day 438 uh, of the Trump presidency, or as he says, longer than any other president. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and it's obviously it's a challenging time uh, and a uh, challenging time for uh, the uh, press, uh, the media, and for higher education, education more generally. Um, it's worth uh, talking for a minute about what it means when you have a presidential candidate and then a president uh, who refers to the press as the enemy of the people, a phrase uh, originated by uh, the late Joseph Stalin, and keep in mind that when Nikita Khrushchev became uh, the head of the Soviet Union, he banned the use of the phrase because he said it was too dangerous. And now it is uh, back. Uh, we know that uh, there is a challenge more generally for the press that comes when you have a president and followers and others who attack the media who attack it often by going after individuals, uh, as we've seen just now with Jeff Bezos, uh, and who try to challenge the very notion of facts uh, and uh, all characteristics that we see, whether it's in how democracies die or many other places uh, of a movement towards autocracy. And we know the challenge comes in the other direction as well. How do you cover a president who's not like any other president? And so much of what I've seen in the press saw during the campaign uh, with a candidate not like other candidates see now is a valiant attempt to try and treat him like any other candidate or any other president, which I viewed as a deep failure uh, on that part. It's also a challenge when, uh, as uh, E.J. Tom and I wrote, uh, you have the first candidate who fended off one scandal with another scandal, and then another scandal and another scandal, and that's what we have now as well. There is scandal fatigue and only so much that you can do day by day by day. It's a challenge when you have to cover the potential movement towards an autocracy in all of its characteristics, when you have to cover uh, a kleptocracy both from the president, the members of his family, and others uh, in the cabinet and elsewhere in the administration. And again, day after day after day, new things. And it is also a challenge if you're trying to cover governance when you have a cacistocracy, uh, which means not just positions unfilled, positions filled by people who are unqualified, uh, nominees that can range from your personal pilot to be the head of the FAA to your doctor to be the head of the Veterans uh, Administration. Uh, at least we did get um, a, a young woman who had been uh, a star on the Disney Channel moving into the White House. So you've got two Mickey Mouse organizations uh, <laughs> uh, operating at the same time. But we have a set of stories that are all out of the norm uh, for the way we deal with things. Now, we have, I think, uh, an additional challenge that comes from the non-traditional, as we could say, media, the tribal media, that make it very difficult, President Trump aside, to sort out truth from non-truth, fact from non-fact. And I would just mention one other thing on that front, uh, the front of the challenges to our larger media, and that is uh, the continued uh, difficulty of newspapers especially to be able to have staff or ability or willingness to do what they are supposed to do. As we saw recently with the revolt at the Denver Post, now uh, the sale of the Akron Beacon Journal, which used to be the flagship of the uh, Knight Ritter chain, uh, to another hedge fund. And I was just down in Greensboro, North Carolina, where they had massive layoffs with a, uh, uh, an investor group that you would think would be a little bit better, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. But of course, they took the ax to their new staff as well, and they are struggling to cover local politics, national politics from a North Carolina level. And we're seeing that all over the place. And on the uh, electronic media front, we have the stories about Sinclair Broadcasting, which have tended to focus 
uh, on, of course, the insert of propaganda into local uh, newscasts, but have largely ignored Sinclair's attempt to acquire the stations from the Tribune Company, which would give it an enormous following covering the vast majority of the country with the prime local news stations in major places, and where they've said that they would deal with it by divesting stations in New York and Chicago, they sold the New York station for a fraction of its value to a trust owned by the family of Sinclair, and the Chicago station uh, at a fraction of its value to a crony of uh, the Sinclair patriarch now uh, who runs one of his businesses. So we're dealing with a very different kind of world than we've had before. All of these attacks include, of course, attacks on educated people, on higher education, and speaking of cacistocracy, an education secretary uh, who has not exactly uh, been a defender of uh, those institutions of higher learning, and all of the work that we have done uh, devalued uh, along the way as well. So that makes for interesting times for all of us. And while we do see some uh, brave journalistic outlets stepping up to the plate, uh, not necessarily having done so entirely during the course of the campaign, now the challenges become that much greater because of the volume of stories that have to be covered. And I noticed just on Twitter today a lot of people complaining that the big news story of the day, which is Donald Trump is now not going to cooperate at all with the Mueller investigation, has been subsumed by a lot of other things going on. So it's a real challenge. Now, to deal with that, we have uh, quite an array of people. Uh, starting over there on your left and my right, Christian Carroll is an editor with the Post's uh, uh, Global Opinion section, but he also writes uh, a great deal, and I was particularly taken with a really interesting and good piece that he wrote on uh, Christopher uh, Steele as a hero, uh, but he's written on a variety of, uh, of uh, topics. Uh, Paul Glastris is the editor-in-chief of the Washington Monthly, which is a must-read uh, for uh, all of us, uh, and he also uh, has uh, written uh, uh, books, uh, one called Elephant in the Room, um, about uh, Washington uh, under the Bush administration, and has his experience in the White House as well in the Clinton uh, administration. Uh, Sabrina T uh, Tavernis is uh, with the New York Times, has a lot of experience in international uh, coverage, uh, including trouble spots like Iraq and Lebanon and Russia, which prepared her beautifully for coming back <laughs> to cover trouble spots in America. And she has fanned out around the country uh, to cover a wide range of topics on politics and people and uh, uh, policy. Jamail Bowie is the chief political correspondent at Slate, a CBS News analyst. I should say I got all of this stuff from, uh, with the uh, help of Cambridge Analytica. And, uh, and I'm, I'm refraining from giving out your uh, social security numbers, uh, the uh, squishy internet sites that you frequent, or any of the other things that they were able to, uh, to tell me. Uh, and. Uh, 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 then we have Gretchen Ritter, who is the uh, Harold, uh, uh, Harold Tanner Dean of Arts and Sciences at uh, Cornell, a professor of government who has written a lot about democratization, uh, the Constitution, and other issues, uh, uh, including the history of politics and policy in American society. So uh, let's uh, start with Christian. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I suspect my remarks will be fairly quick. Um, I'd like to start very quickly with an example from Eastern Europe, which I think is entirely appropriate to the subject because as we've, seen, as we've seen, there isn't that much of a difference between Eastern Europe and the United States anymore. Um, so I was talking a few months ago to a friend of mine who is one of the leading journalists in Riga in Latvia, and he was out of a job, and I thought this was terribly sad because he was an employee for a long time of the leading quality newspaper in Latvia, which is really very, very good. So what happened, I asked him, and he told me this very interesting story. So his paper, let's call it the quality newspaper, had long been in competition with the other major Latvian newspaper, which was a kind of tabloidy newspaper run by one of the local oligarchs, a very shady character, very corrupt. And the paper, correspondingly, was filled with stories that you know businessmen could order from the corresponding journalists for a certain sum. 
uh, all kinds of sensationalist garbage, and the journalists were just as corrupt as the owner. And I thought, well, yeah, it shouldn't have been too hard to compete with those guys. And he said, yeah, it wasn't. I mean, we were the leading paper. People loved us. And uh, the, this oligarch really began to get kind of upset about it because uh, he, he really wanted to hit, hit us hard. And everything he did failed until he finally came up with the brilliant idea of telling everyone that we were funded by George Soros. And from one day to the next, their reputation was shattered. That, you know, he, this oligarch basically said, this newspaper is a tool in the hands of George Soros, this evil foreigner, need I say, under my breath, the Jewish George Soros. And uh, he's nefarious and he's undermining our country. And these people are, wink, wink, just as corrupt as my people are. That was kind of the subtext, right? And very quickly, people began to believe it. The reputation of the newspaper was absolutely destroyed. And as he told me, he said, once your reputation is gone, it really takes a long time to build it up again. And uh, his paper actually went bankrupt. I mean, again, perhaps an unusual example, very small market. But I think you can perhaps see the relevance of this story to some of the things we're experiencing here. Uh, so to me, there are three points about this story that are really worth noting. The first one, of course, is the financial aspect. Uh, this is obviously a very big part of American journalism today. Norm alluded to it, especially with the terrible, terrible destruction of local newspapers. I saw this amazing statistic in one of our pieces in the Washington Post. From 1990 to 2016, newspaper employees in the US fell from, that's a 20, uh, a 26-year period, U.S. newspaper employees fell from 456,000 to 183,000. And that, of course, is a result of this very diverse uh, and in some ways vibrant, but very, very complex and fragmented media landscape in which we now find ourselves. One in which, for example, Facebook now intermediates almost everything that newspapers like mine and Sabrina's do. The second point I wanted to make is, I think, especially relevant. Uh, it's this widespread, widespread sense of confusion in the world today about who journalists are and what they do. And I notice this especially frequently in the letters I get from people responding to my stories. I try not to engage with trolls online, but I do try to engage them when they take the trouble of writing me an email. And it is quite amazing because there are a lot of people out there who genuinely believe that I am in the direct pay of Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National Committee. Uh, for the record, I am an independent. I hope that's not too upsetting for you. Um, and I do not, I've actually written quite a few critical articles about the person in question. Uh, and I work for the Washington Post, which actually doesn't take orders from anybody, as far as I can tell. Um, so, but what strikes me about this is really the extraordinary depth to which people don't even understand what we do. Periodically, I get letters from people and they say, how dare you call this news that was overtly biased and entirely unobjective? And I said, well, that's why we put the word opinions at the top of the page so that you can see that it's an opinion article. I work in the opinion section. And guess what? That doesn't matter to people. That doesn't matter to people. It's just the Washington Post. And so suddenly we begin to realize that all these fine, you know, noble distinctions that we've built up over the years between the advertising side and the, and the editorial side, between the newsroom and the opinion section, you know, there's a very religiously observed firewall between the two at the Post. Do readers even know that? Do they even see it? So there's a sense that there's a real, um, you know, crisis of trust in my profession, and I, I experience it every day in the most visceral of ways. And the third and final thing I wanted to mention, and again, uh, this is particularly interesting to me as someone who, like, like Sabrina, we know each other from Moscow from the old days, um, is, uh, is the war on truth, I think is what you can call it, the war on factuality. And we have seen how some of these techniques, which were perfected, by no means invented, but perfected by the Russians, have now come to function very effectively in all kinds of different contexts. 
One of the most amazing interviews I think I've had in the past two years was with the guy who does social, social media for Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. And he basically described it as, a f as a, for him, it was a form of warfare, right? He, he had no interest in uh, you know, pitting his version of truth, which he genuinely believed in, against some, uh, another version of truth, which was based on a separate set of facts. Didn't even care about it. For him, putting out information was a way of destroying your opponent, right? And now we find ourselves in this environment where uh, the, the factual content of an assertion no longer has the weight that it once did, right? Now, and in conclusion, I'd just like to say, I think there are identifiable prob uh, answers to all of these problems. I don't think these are insoluble problems, but they're extremely thorny, and I think it's quite obvious to everyone in this room, we've only just begun addressing them with the serious that's needed. Okay, so I'm sure we'll talk about all of this in a little while. But that's my that those are my opening thoughts. Thanks. Paul. So thank you. Um, Christian's uh, and I go back to nineteen ninety five in Berlin. So he, he's been helping me out for many years and is doing so again today. Thank you. Um, so it, the idea that that democratic government relies on a free and independent press um, uh, to keep government officials and other people with power and other entities accountable and to keep voters and citizens informed with the facts they need to make judgments is just axiomatic. We all believe it, um, as did the founders of the country. Only in the face of a government with strong authoritarian tendencies, as we have now, can we really test that proposition? And I think a recent story in Politico that I, I would really recommend to you all uh, offers an excellent first stab at the test, um, at such a test. Now, what Politico did was it used data from a company that audits subscriber information for print and digital publications to look at the percentage of households in nearly every county in America that have one or more subscriptions, uh, either digital or print. Did you see this? It's an amazing piece. Now, what it found was that in counties with the fewest percentage of households subscribe, subscribing to news sources, Donald Trump did the best. In fact, better than Mitt Romney had done in 2012. Whereas in counties with a higher percentage of households that subscribe to news sources, Romney did better than Trump, and of course, you know, Hillary did even better the higher you went uh, in the percentage. For every 10% of households in a county that subscribe to a news outlet, Trump's vote share dropped by an average of 0.5%. And those links were statistically significant, even factoring in, you know, employment, education, et cetera. So, so these were fairly robust findings. Um, now, the decline in, in local news is an old story. Um, and that decline has been bemoaned for many reasons, uh, most especially the loss of accountability when it comes to, you know, holding local governments accountable, you know, the no reporters at City Hall problem. Uh, but what is new in this Politico story is evidence of a connection between the, lo the erosion of local news outlets and the rise of authoritarianism in, po in politics nationally. Um, Local news outlets, Politico, uh, the political authors note, tend to be highly trusted by the people in those communities. I, you know, I, I, if you grew up in, a, in the hinterlands, I grew up in St. Louis, nobody was more trusted than the local news anchors who had been there for 25, 30 years. And they just were, everybody watched them every night. And, and, uh, and you know, same too with the local columnists and the local, a little bit to the local reporters, but the, the local newspapers depending on your politics, were very much trusted uh, to provide news that, that people needed. When such outlets disappear, the void gets filled by partisan national media like Fox News and social media like Facebook and indeed Donald Trump's own Twitter feed. Fun fact, Trump's 50 million Twitter followers is larger than the number of subscribers to all news outlets, print and digital, in the country. 
Um, now, are there, there are some met methodological issues to this uh, story that one could raise. Subscription rates are, at best, a rough proxy for actual news consumption. The story shows correlation, not causation. Uh, this, these so-called news deserts, that there's a concept in, in, in media studies, uh, uh, just like we have food deserts, we have news deserts, that Politico is measuring also happens to be you know, rural and exurban counties that have lots of other reasons to support Trump. Nevertheless, the analysis does ring true to a lot of other things we know uh, to be true or sense to be true about our national politics. Now, here's a stat you probably don't know but probably won't be surprised by. In 2014, almost one in five U.S. reporters worked in New York, Washington, or Los Angeles, compared to one in eight in 2004. That's how stripped the middle 90% of the country has been in, in news reporting. Moreover, and, and this is the main point I wanna, I wanna make today, the economic and technical forces that have virtually annihilated independent local media in America uh, are the same ones that have undermined the economies of those very same parts of the country and helped make their desperate and downwardly mobile residents prey to the right-wing populism that promises to bring their jobs and communities back even it is, as it attacks the foundations of democracy. Now, let me offer a few personal observations based on 30 plus years in the journalism business. B back in the day, if you wanted to make it big as a reporter, the expected path was when you got out of college or out of J school, you went and you got a job at a small town newspaper. And you know, some people liked it so much they stayed, never left. Most cycled through, they did a year or two or three. Um, that benefited the papers, they got young, hungry reporters at a, at a low price. Um, but it benefited the reporters in that they took away experiences of exurban, rural, small town life that they otherwise wouldn't have and connections to those places which they would carry on throughout the rest of their career. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, not didn't personally follow that particular route, but I did become at a young age the uh, correspondent for a news magazine, US News, in, in the Midwest. And the dirty little secret that I quickly learned was that almost all of my story ideas came from reading local and regional papers, right? And my editors thought I was brilliant, I was just reading other people's stuff. <laughs> and you know, if you've been a foreign correspondent, you know that's, that's how the game is played. Local, local coverage, local reporters are your translators or your fixers, you know, you're picking up stuff from them. So there's a, the, 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 at the local level is where the reporting first happens. Um, and so, you know, when you ask yourself, how is it that neither the press nor political operatives in Washington had sufficient sense of the groundswell of support Donald Trump was building in rural and small town America, um, you know, certainly one of the reasons was the severing of the ties between national journalists and small towns. Another fact most people don't understand is that even here in Washington back in the day, local and regional newspapers had a huge presence. Um, each of the large regional newspapers had two, three, four, sometimes a couple dozen reporters in the Washington bureaus um, that, uh, whose job was to, 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 to follow, to cover the local congressional delegation and the industries that were important to that locality. Um, they were often, these journalists, more knowledgeable about uh, the most knowledgeable members of the press on those particular policy areas. And moreover, they understood how to write about what the substance of Washington, what Washington does, the grants, the regulations, the bills, in a way that made sense be to local people because it was tailored to what they knew and what they cared about. Even small towns that couldn't afford to send a reporter would hire a, a firm like State's News Service. Anybody remember State's News Service? Right, right, State's News. They, they had a whole business model where they would hire young people and say, all right, you're covering HUD for the Northeast. And that's what you did, and you wrote 20 stories on UDAG grants that were sent out that day, each tailored to different, different local markets. So, so the public understood what was happening in Washington, where their tax dollars were being spent, how they had somebody asking tough questions and so forth. 
Now today, the vast majority of those Washington bureau jobs are gone. Very few regional or local papers can afford them. States' news service is out of business. But that doesn't mean there aren't a ton of reporters in Washington. There are more than ever, actually, but they're basically two kinds. There's reporters for national publications, like the Post and the Times. Um, they're predominantly covering politics. Some of them are doing great government beat reporting, but the, 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 the eyeballs are in politics. And the other group are what we call the paywall journalists. And these are journalists that write for Politico Pro and some of these other, you know, um, Bloomberg government. And there's just hundreds, maybe thousands of these journalists. And they cover the substance of government with minute detail, great accuracy, this fantastic reporting. None of us ever see a lick of it because it's written for an audience of lobbyists and hedge fund managers and Hill staffers and, 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 and think tank people who are narrowly focused on, on that issue. Um, so the American public basically doesn't have anybody explaining to them what's going on substantively in Washington. Um, and it's no coincidence that the period that saw the decline of Washington coverage by local and regional newspapers also saw the rise of a palpable pop populist outrage in which Americans became more and more suspicious of how their tax dollars are being spent and grew to believe Washington insiders operate at ever greater levels of power and secrecy, because it's the case. Um, it's also, I think, part of the dysfunction in Washington that is also grounds for the authoritarianism, the I alone can fix it. Um, think about the congressman 30 years ago who, when he stepped out of his office, there were five reporters from his district or 10 reporters from his state or her state willing to take, write a story on his hearing or his bill or whatever. There are lawmakers now who have literally nobody covering them on a day-to-day -day basis. The only way that they can get coverage is to go back home and go to a Rotary Club lunch. They, they may not even find a reporter there. And so their, their, their audience, their voters, know Congress only through the leaders of Congress that they see on MSNBC and Fox and CNN. They, they don't know that guy anymore. And so that person is now beholden to the leadership. He does not have a, a personal realm of power and independence. So, so to protect American democracy, I think we need to have a renaissance of fact-based, locally focused, tailored journalism in America. And I, I would love to, I've already talked probably past my 10 minutes, but I'll, I'll give you at least the three categories of solutions I think that are, that are available to us. One is philanthropic, right? The rise of nonprofit journalism. The Washington Monthly is uh, nonprofit. Um, you know, we have income from advertising and subscription revenue, but mostly we get grants from foundation. Um, there's local news like Texas Tribune. There's this new outfit called Report for America, which is very interesting. It's uh, run by my friend Steve Waldman, and it basically provides grants to reporters to go become local reporters for two or three years, or a year or two. So that's category number one. Category number two is federal solutions tailored to the media. What can be done through federal policy to fix the media? And I won't go into any detail. We, I'd love to talk about that later. But, but the idea that we can't have federal policy tailored to the media is nonsense. Um, the, in the Constitution, the, the founders wrote in that the post office, which was the basic infrastructure for the media back then, the cutting edge infrastructure, the Facebook of its day, had to be owned by the government uh, or certainly directed by the government. So, so uh, there's nothing constitutional keeping us from writing laws, regulations, and so forth to make local media uh, thrive and profitable. And then the third area uh, is, as I said before, the problem of the decline of the media, local media, is really part and parcel of the, of the collapse of the economy in these areas. Um, there's a lot of debate about what that collapse is. Donald Trump says it's the Mexicans and, and, and you know, global trade. You know, there's probably something to the global trade part, but I personally think it's it's, it's the rise of consolidated industry that's strip-mined 90% of the country of its, of its companies. Fix that, and I think you'll fix the problem of profitability and reporting at the local level.
Allá, allá. Sabrina. Is this on? It is? OK, yeah. thanks. Um, OK, so my colleagues have zoomed way up high and given excellent overviews. And I'm going to go down low and give you the view of a lowly reporter um, over the past year. I, I, um, I work for the New York Times National Desk. Um, so I travel around the country and write about kind of, at this point, luckily, what strikes my fancy. But it's been, since the election, kind of cultural and political divide in America. Um, and so the way I shorthand what I do when I meet people is um, uh, I say, you know, basically I cover people who voted for Trump. Um, and that's, that's um, <laughs> I, that is what I do. Um, I do that because journalistically I feel, um, and I'm going to read my remarks, so sorry. I'm not uh, as um, eloquent and brainy as Christian. I can't do it without reading. Um, so I do it because that's, um, um, that's where I'm most kind of curious uh, in terms of what's going on in the country right now. Um, it's also what I know least. And uh, in order to be right about where things might be going, uh, I feel like this is, I, I need to spend a lot of time in, in communities with people um, who are on the other side of the cultural divide from me in order to um, kind of get under the skin of what's going on in America right now. Um, so uh, I first came back from being abroad in Russia, Turkey, and Iraq, and Pakistan in 2010. Um, I was uh, assigned by the National Desk at the time to cover um, events in a number of states, including Ohio. And I spent a lot of time in Ohio in 2010. Um, I remember being in Youngstown, walking around a kind of a weedy Olmsted-designed park and looking at these giant, turn of the century, very elegant stone mansions um, with plywood nailed over their front windows, um, and having a lot of conversations with people. And the people I talked to reminded me a lot of Russians I had covered in the, 19, in the early 1990s um, during their deep industrial decline. Um, you know, if only the factory would, would start up again. Um, if only we could go back to an earlier period where we knew our salary would buy sausages and afford us a modest vacation to Bulgaria. Um, and it was kind of, it was hard to cover that at the time, in part because I had just come back and was sort of trying to understand what I was seeing, but also in part because I think newspapers um, are sort of preoccupied, as you would guess, as by things that are new. Uh, and Youngstown, Ohio, and the decline was not new. Um, and was, for my editors, not surprising. So I said, you know, this is crazy. Do you understand what I'm looking at? And they would say, yeah, it's been like that since 1982. So, like, you know, how are you going to write about that? Um, so, but I did have a sense that there was some emotion there in that decline and that decay as there was in Russia because, you know, we know the, the, the result in Russia and, and, and I was drawn to the emotion of that. Um, so since the election, I've traveled a lot. Um, I mean, I did before the election, but um, uh, to Ohio, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and many states. Um, I try to take the time to seek out people with good arguments, not just uh, random encounters in malls or Walmart parking lots, which often we have to do as well because we're doing things quickly. Um, I am grateful to my newspaper for allowing me to take that time. Um, and there are a few things I've gleaned that I'll just try to distill for you guys right here. Um, and pardon me if you've, Theta has already given you chapter and verse on all of this. I feel a little bit like perhaps she has, and I'm going to be a little bit of a repeat here, but I'm, here goes. Um, so first is that, um, so Trump voters are not a monolith. Um, if you think about it, it's effectively half the country. Um, it's only a small minority or hardcore supporters, or you know, a minority or hardcore supporters. I remember one guy early last year, a consultant outside Atlanta, um, stopped me mid-sentence when I was starting to tell him I was interviewing Trump supporters for an article I was doing. He said, Sabrina, I voted for Trump, but I'm not a supporter of his. Um, oftentimes, we're lulled into thinking that people who are different than us are all the same, but they aren't. People had really different reasons for voting for the guy. Some people voted for him because they hated Hillary. Some people voted for him because Scalia died. Some people voted for him because they were so mad at Hillary edging out Bernie in the primaries that they couldn't bring themselves to vote for her. I find people are pretty repulsed these days by politics generally, uh, both parties. 
and I talk to a lot of people who just don't vote at all. Um, so the second thing, the anger at the media is real. Um, I'll tell a short story that kind of explains this, and for me was kind of an, uh, a, a sort of an, 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 a surprising moment. It kind of gave me an insight. I went to Minnesota um, around the time of the election, I think it was shortly after, uh, to talk to a guy named Larry who had a scrap metal business. Um, he agreed to talk to me about what news he consumes. Um, it was the beginning of the fake news discussion, so editors were desperate for a story about a person who was actually consuming fake news. Um, Larry taught me a few things. So some people might believe a lot of this stuff, he said, kind of scrolling around on his Facebook feed. We were sitting in his kitchen, and uh, I guess it was like a, kind of a middle, lower middle class suburb of like distant Minneapolis. Um, like, for example, the self-investigating pizza parlor guy, you remember him. Um, but a lot of people consume these crazy stories for a different reason, namely my friend Larry. It makes them feel really good. He had a metaphor that I found quite brilliant. You know the player on the hockey team whose job it is to beat the crap out of the other team's really good player, that guy? You know, he's kind of doing a bad thing, but you kind of can't get enough of watching him? That's fake news. It makes you feel good. It's satisfying tribal, uh, impulse. That's not the right word. But um, um, the other thing I learned was just how deep his fury was at liberals. And that's connected to the media thing, I think. Um, I know. Um, he counts the media in that. Um, they have this sneering sense of superiority, he said. Um, he said, you guys treat us like flat earthers. You're like, I know the earth is round, and I know you think it's flat. Someday I'll explain round earth theory to you, but today I'm too busy, so sit down and shut up and do what I say because you're too dumb to be trusted with anything. <laughs> so that was Larry, and I had to kind of think about myself and how I went about thinking about stories and talking to people and how, you know, we often have these assignments where we're asked to, you know, scramble out into the country in a matter of hours and ask people about X and Y, you know, latest outrage that's perpetrated. And you know, I don't know, it made me think about um, how I had been approaching uh, kind of my, my reporting task and, and, uh, and, and, and that there had, that the, a lot of people felt like there was a fundamental lack of respect and kind of sort of leering at pygmy attitude that they felt that liberal media people had when they came to their communities. Um, the third, oh, and by the way, his favorite thing to do at that time when I was with him was just to, because it was right after the election, was just to watch on constant loop um, CNN and NBC announcers laughing at Trump and how ridiculous he was and how he would never get elected. So third, people are a lot more moderate than you think. I mean, there are a lot of Larrys out there, deeply political, full of fury and outrage, but I don't enc actually encounter them that often. I mean, yes, you get them in your email inbox, and you know, there's a lot of like older people who like to, or whoever, I don't even know who they are, sit around in their underwear and yell at people online. But but when you go, <laughs> <laughs> when you go out there and actually talk to people, um, you don't really encounter this type that much. Um, so I'm often asked to go interview people, Trump voters, because I'm the Trump voters girl, about what they think of the latest outrage in Washington that their guy is perpetrating. The last time I did this was for the tax bill in December. I was sitting in a room full of electricians in training in Canton, Ohio one night, and they all give me these quizzical looks. Tax bill? I guess I heard about a bill, but I never really thought about it until you asked me. Um, so we, all of us, are immersed in politics. So we assume that other people are too. Uh, but for most people, their lives are too busy. Their lives are not, a gr it's, like, it's like we like live like a graduate seminar or something, and they don't live like a graduate seminar. Um, they are overwhelmed with their lives, um, and so overwhelmed to think much about any of this stuff at all. And so I think that often, just in thinking of the media, when we, the journalists, show up in their communities asking questions about political preference, um, 
in some sense, it di displaces reality, sort of. It's like brings the graduate seminar to them, asks them to react to it, and then we write a story about it. Um, I, I mean, as one small example, I was in, again, Ohio um, last week in um, a little place called Rittman, which has a bad opioid problem. Um, I was talking to this um, single mom who had three kids and was trying to get her hair salon license, and her mom works at Burger King for eight bucks and 50 cents an hour, and she didn't want to be like her mom, and we had this whole conversation. Her life is completely crazy, and talk, interviewing her required, like, having three kids, like, grabbing up my computer and, like, throwing my notebook. I mean, it was just her, 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 the room was insane. Um, and I just felt like such a nerd kind of being like, excuse me, how about your political choice? She was like, I don't even, I mean, you know, 60 out of 78 people in my 2007 graduating class are addicted to opioids. So I don't really know about political choice. She did vote. I was asking her about her political choice. That was the story I was doing. But as an example of like, their life isn't a graduate seminar and ours is. Um, lastly, somewhat hopefully, um, to the point of like, we're all so entrenched in our tribes that we can't get out of them. I'll share a story about my own cynicism and how it was proven wrong last year. I spent several months on a story about, a tw and by the way, this is cynicism about my own tribe. Um, I spent several months on a story about a 20-year-old in western Arkansas who helped vandalize a mosque. His name was Abraham. He did it with a friend who, by all accounts, had a pretty racist streak. Um, there were swastikas and all this ug ugly stuff written all over the mosque. And out of the blue, from jail, after the kids arrested, he sends a letter to the mosque apologizing for what he'd done. No legal counsel, nothing. It's western Arkansas. He's indigent, so he didn't see a lawyer for months. Actually, it was just pure conscience. He told me later he didn't even think the mosque people would ever read it, thought they would throw it in the trash. Uh, his mother, Kristen, and his brother, Noah, agreed to talk to me. And I spent weeks, for th weeks with them while he was in jail, waiting for his day in court. The family was poor. They often didn't have the money for gas. Their water was cut off at one point when I was there. The boy's father, who had died years before, had been abusive, and that had left a deep mark on Abraham, on all of them, actually. The story ran a week after Charlottesville. I was really worried. I thought readers were going to be really angry that I was asking them to have empathy for someone like Abraham, this like white kid who, you know, participated in this pretty heinous act. I was figuring out how to help them. I was basically talking to the tech people of t telling them how to take down their Facebook pages. I mean, they were like had no idea that this world was about to like come like, you know, um tsunami over them. So I was thinking, god, if they're mobbed, I need to probably help them like um, you know, take this stuff down. And the piece was posted early on a Saturday morning and I was sitting in my kitchen in Washington, D.C., bracing myself. The comments started rolling in, but it wasn't at all what I expected. They were overwhelmingly positive. In hundreds and hundreds of comments, there was not a single angry one, which is unprecedented. I mean, every, I mean all the stories from Russia, Iraq, every, everybody, everybody always sends angry emails, and this story basically had none. Um, for the record, Abe told me the same. All the comments on his Facebook page were well-wishers, not one shouter. People even sent money that actually saved Abe and his family from being homeless. They were being evicted that weekend. So I was wrong about readers being so entrenched in their own camp that they would not be able to or want to absorb his story. I thought that they would reject it, but they responded with this outpouring. Um, readers said the story reminded them that Americans could be good and flexible and moderate and that maybe the fury in their Facebook feeds was not really that representative of what was actually going on out there. It was like eating a carrot after binging on some terrible sweet for a long time. Um, so what's the moral here? If you always expect the worst from your tribe, maybe you'll be wrong. The social psychologists tell us that in periods of extreme polarization, the thing to do is emphasize our sameness. The th look at the things we have in common as Americans. And I know that no one is really in the mood to do that right now. But when we try, sometimes we have surprising results. I see a New York Times Magazine piece out of everything you just said. I hope you'll write it up so that way. Jamel. So uh, much of this conversation, I think its departure point has been either the election or uh, during the election or post-election. And I want to take you back to the, the, the far past of 2014. Um, 
before Trump had even announced, uh, before any of this, and to what was, I think, the most divisive story in national, in national politics, national press at the time, which was Black Lives Matter, which was the uh, uprisings in Ferguson, um, and it, about around this time last year, uh, this time in 2015 in Baltimore, um, a couple years before that in Sanford, Florida, just the, the police shootings and the, uh, the vigilante violence that prompt protest in community and community uh, across the country. And I, I had gone to Ferguson, I had gone to Baltimore, and, uh, and to North Charleston after Walter Scott. Um, and the thing that struck me while I was there, while I was talking to people in these communities, was a comment I kept hearing. And it was, uh, and I think other reporters of color, black reporters specifically, could probably attest to this too, which was essentially, thank you for being here. A sense that because we shared this cultural connection of both being black, that they might be able to trust this national reporter to be fair to their story, to be fair to their community, to tell it with some empathy, uh, to not simply uh, regurgitate or play into hoary stereotypes about these places. I mentioned this um, uh, because I, I, think, I think they were right. Uh, there was a lot of good journalism coming out of all of this, but it was a problem that the elite newspapers uh, and magazines sending people were sending mostly white folks. Um, they were sending mostly white people with elite educations, mostly white people with elite educations who may live in diverse cities but typically have completely homogenous social circles, who do not spend very much time um, with people who don't look like them or have their education or even really en uh, engage in professions outside of theirs. And I think we're, we're tuned to this problem uh, with regards to Trump and Trump voters. Uh, and that's important. Um, and, and sort of trying to account for it um, has been an important way of, uh, of sort of um, understanding people who voted for Trump, understanding these communities. But I, I think there is a way in which the lack of diversity in the press corps, in addition to making stories around race and racism uh, harder to tell, harder to report, um, also has a distorting effect on our stories about Trump voters. Uh, and so what I want to talk about a little bit is what I think that distorting effect is and, and how I think that is important to this in this moment of thinking about a democracy and thinking about moving forward. So there's the trope. It's Thanksgiving. You don't want to talk about politics because someone at your dinner table is, might say something insane. You might have an uncle who supports Trump, a cousin who supports Trump. You may have a cousin who's really into Alex Jones. Who, who knows what could happen? I've never had this experience. <laughs> My friends have never had this experience. I have relatives with janky opinions, don't get me wrong. But I've never had the, I just keep on doing this. I've never had the experience of, it's fine, it's fine, of being at a dinner table uh, and having to worry about one of my relatives saying something extremely racist. Uh, and so for me, as, as a person, as a journalist, um, uh, racism is both personal in a way, because it's something I experience, but also it's something I can intellectualize really easily. Because I don't, there's no one in my family I have to think about, whose, whose feelings I have to think about. There's no one in my life, in my, in, in my, my close associations, for whom um, I necessarily I'm necessarily thinking of them uh, both as racist and people that I love. Um, this is true for white journalists, and I think it's a problem. And I think it's a problem because for as important as it is to develop and build empathy and understand uh, uh, Americans across the spectrum, including Americans who voted for Trump, including Americans who voted for Trump for very ugly reasons, I think the downside of that is it can have this effect of obscuring the racism there, of, of obscuring the extent to which these grievances may be deeply felt, but they're not necessarily the kind of grievances that should be respected in, in, in the course of mainstream political life. Um, that uh, in the case, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the case of our, our recent events in Charlottesville, it's important to both understand the people who came to march, on ta march in town, 
but also to avoid sort of being complicit in our coverage when we're thinking about and talking about and trying to understand these people. And I think white journalists have a harder time doing this. Um, the best people uh, uh, covering this beat, um, uh, one of them is to my right, is, uh, are very skilled at not being complicit, not, uh, not sort of tacitly excusing um, racist grievances, uh, not obscuring the extent to which those, those are what are motivating some of what's happening. Um, but not everyone's like that. And what I think it does for the larger political culture is it makes it difficult to actually address what's happening. What's happening, in part, is a, a racist backlash. It does involve um, millions of white Americans, maybe not most of them, but a substantial number of them, whose primary uh, or whose major grievance is that the United States is rapidly changing uh, as a country, that it is less white, that its political leadership is less white, that being white no longer gets you the kind of advantages and the kinds of deference in society that it, it used to. And people are angry about that, and people are upset about that, and we should not, uh, we should not obscure that. Um, we should not try to explain it away, and we shouldn't present it as, and this is a value judgment, but we shouldn't necessarily present it as sort of like an understandable response. Many people in the society are disenfranchised, and many people in the society face material deprivation. Not all of them respond with ethno-nationalist rage. Only, only one slice of voters respond that way, and I think it's important to highlight that. All right. I think white reporters may have a hard time doing this, in part because these people kind of include some of their family members, um, may remind them of people that they know. Uh, and the empathy that that can produce, I think, can also be an, an analytical problem. Uh, and so the, the lack of journalists of color, of black journalists, of Latino journalists, not only does, does it extend to this problem of, of, of covering on the ground racism and white supremacy, as Professor Johnson mentioned earlier, if she's still here um, in her response to the previous panel, that white supremacy is happening on the ground and it's, uh, it's meaningful and it, it needs to be addressed. And, uh, but also, I think reporters of color bring a different lens and a different eye to how to think about Trump voters and how to think about these communities, um, how to, think, how to, how, how to, to counterpose um, uh, the the disadvantage in a place um, in a place like uh, Jonestown, not Jonestown, I'm uh, Youngstown. I'm reading a book on Jonestown, and so it's it's in my book in my mind. Um, Youngstown with a place like Petersburg, Virginia, um, which is very poor, uh, which is predominantly black, um, which is sort of a, a poster child for post-industrial decline, but doesn't seem to get the same sympathy and attention and accordance that places of white working class decline get. Um, to wrap it up real quickly, my remarks are short. There need to be more journalists of color in elite newsrooms. There need to be more journalists of color covering this particular beat of Trump. Um, and there, need, there needs to be a willingness to uh, let those journalists of color kind of cover the Trump phenomena in um, a light that may appear to be unflattering, that may not appear to be fair, but for black communities, for Latino communities, is what it looks like for them, right? For them, they don't, they, they, all they see is increased ICE enforcement. For them, all they see is a Department of Justice that's taken its, uh, taken whatever little oversight it had over rogue police departments, just taking it away. Um, letting, uh, covering Trump from that perspective, I think can help illuminate um, what's happening, help us collectively have a better, un better understanding of what's happening with the Trump, Trump movement, the Trump phenomena, uh, and in the course of tackling it, uh, addressing it, um, thinking about the ways uh, in which we can prevent it from happening again, um, help us advance the understanding too. So. Gretchen. Okay.
Um, I want to thank the um, organizers of this event, the Center, Center for the Study of Inequality, and for uh, New America Foundation, and for all the presenters and participants. This has been a wonderful couple of days uh, for me, and I hope we'll continue a lot of these conversations. I want to talk a little bit about higher education, and I want to talk about higher education's role in helping to uh, undergird a diverse democracy. I want to talk about the context right now and how that affects higher ed. I want to say a couple of words about the critiques that are happening. I don't have nearly enough time to cover all the critiques, but I'll mention a few of the, the major ones. And then if we have enough time, I also want to uh, say something about what I think we might do in response to some of this. So how is higher ed important to democracy? We talk a lot about educating citizens. I think that's true. And I think there are aspects of what we do to educate citizens that are underappreciated. It's not just having the knowledge to judge policy. It's being able to interact in diverse environments. It's being able to consider other points of view. Uh, it's being aware of uh, the broader world that is important to this as well. Uh, we are also, I think, an important vehicle for opportunity and inclusion in American society. And if you believe that opportunity and equality are important for a healthy democracy, we should value the institutions that contribute to that quite a bit. And I think that higher ed has done that historically. Uh, and uh, that contribution is a bit frayed at the moment, which should concern all of us, but that it is something that we should try to strengthen and support. And finally, I think higher education contributes in what we do in our research. That part of our role is to be able to provide objective, not beholden to anyone, uh, research on critical issues that can inform debates uh, in a similar role in this regard to the importance of what media does to help people to sort of judge what politicians are saying and to think about where they should come down on some of these issues. So with that kind of framing in mind, we talk a little bit about the current circumstances and why that sort of puts us in a fraught situation. We've talked a lot about social polarization here, and I do think that social polarization frames what's happening and how higher education is being understood to a much greater extent than many of us appreciate. And it's polarization that we've talked about that has to do with inequality, it is polarization that is geographic. It is polarization, of course, that is deeply political as well. And it's polarization that has to do with uh, social diversity uh, as well. And I think it's important for us to understand that in this polarized context, we are clearly seen as on one side of the divide, right? I think we often imagine ourselves as somehow sort of neutral, now. we're not. We are clearly seen as being on one side of the divide. So a lot of the critique just, I think, comes from this context of polarization. I think there's a couple of other sort of general things about that polarized environment that aren't directly pointed to higher ed, but nonetheless affect us. One is that it's an environment in which institutions, major social institutions in general, there is growing distrust in all of them. And we are part of that. We are seeing polling indications that we, like every other major American institution now, there's a less faith in uh, the extent to which we are a force for good in society. Uh, I think there's also a distrust of expertise and knowledge, which is, of course, part of what we provide. And this is partly because we live in a context in which 
uh, people's avenue into knowledge tends to be much more social and experiential and tends to be amplified by a social media structure that provides us with ready access to opinions that echo and amplify our own. Right? So I think understanding how people tend to come to knowledge and an atmosphere in which they distrust what's regarded as neutral knowledge is part of what we are contending with as well. Uh, and finally, I think it's we need to just understand that everything right now is viewed through a partisan lens. So you're either on the side of being with us or against us. There's not a lot of room for judging institutions and groups as neutral. So we need to understand that we will be judged. And it's clear that for the most part we are being judged as being on the liberal side, on the cosmopolitan side of that divide. Okay. In terms of the critiques that are being made of universities, one of the common critiques that we uh, haven't paid a lot of attention to that I think is actually quite broad, it has to do with cost. And it's a critique about cost that is both about universities becoming inaccessible to people because of the cost of tuition, and it's a critique about cost that has to do with a lack of accountability for our spending. This is, I think, fed in part by distrust, but it's also part of a moment of inequality and anxiety about people's economic opportunities. <laughs> so even though many of our institutions have great financial aid packages, I think we need to understand that for lots of folks, college just feels <coughs> out of reach. And that's a source of deep anxiety and it's a source of some resentment. Uh, and we need to think about why tuition in particular is the most available lever for higher education, for private higher education to address their own cost concerns at this moment and the importance, I think, of finding other levers. Another main <coughs> critique of higher education has to do with values. Uh, we are seen, I think, as institutions that express values of cosmopolitanism, that tend to be international orientations, that tend not to be as tuned in to the values of communities that may be more religious. Uh, that tend not to be as tuned into the values of communities that may be more traditional in their orientation to things like family. And so I think for many families, the, one of the dangers that they see of sending their kids to college is the impact that that will have on their values. Uh, I think another source of critique, and I expect that this critique will amplify over time, has to do with admissions. And there are several strands of the admissions critique that are worth paying attention to. One, which has been there for a while, that's gonna continue to grow, is a critique of affirmative action policies. Uh, and this, I think, is very much in this broader context of racial nationalism that we see growing in this country. But there's also critiques that have to do with uh, the perception that the children of the wealthy have an easier chance of getting into college than the children of middle class or working class families. Uh, and there's also a critique of legacy policies, of course, many universities. And there's a critique of admission structures that uh, open the door to international students. And that last critique has a kind of particular flavor to it, I think, in the context of state universities as well, where there's a sense of we are supposed to be creating opportunities for our kids. Why are we instead creating opportunities for uh, kids from other countries. And I think we need to do a better job of understanding and addressing those uh, critiques. And then finally, the last main critique I'll mention is a lack of ideological diversity on our campuses. And it's a critique of the faculty, it's a critique of the administrations, and it's a critique of the students. 
Uh, and uh, whether we think that that's fully merited or not, uh, as I will say in a minute, I actually think it's something for us to pay attention to. I think there are good reasons why we ought to be caring about diversity, and I would say that, in fact, this conference is a good example of an approach that does uh, that well. Uh, and then I'll just say a couple of words about what are some of the consequences of this, I think, growing attack that we're beginning to see on higher education. Uh, the consequences are cuts in funding. The consequences will be that we will be less influential because we're seen as partisan, so people will pay less attention to us. The consequences will be growing calls for regulation. You're seeing that a lot at state universities now and efforts to do things like uh, influence the curriculum that's offered. Uh, and the consequences will be things like trying to tax philanthropy that's aimed at higher education. All of those strike me as things that we should be caring about. Uh, and I will hold for discussion some of my thoughts about some of the things that I think we can, we can do about this. But uh, if we do believe that this is a, a sector that contributes to American democracy, I think we ought to be paying a lot more attention than we currently are to the growing critique of higher ed. Thank you. Thanks uh, to a terrific, uh, diverse panel, uh, some of whom had contacts, of course, through their times in Moscow and Germany. I do think we ought to add the one thing that binds us all together, which is that we're all funded by George Soros. <laughs> and I know we're not supposed to talk about it, but we're, we're among friends. And how he's managed to finance the millions of people who've marched, uh, even as the rest of us, I'm just not sure. Uh, one point on the higher education stuff, uh, which Gretchen alluded to, that, you know, we have an educational divide in our politics now that's growing as well. And the overt attack by Congress, this really wasn't an uh, administration thing, on the uh, endowments of uh, elite institutions and then making sure that a couple of institutions that were theirs were not covered uh, in Kentucky, uh, among uh, other places, uh, combined with now this effort to uh, challenge the admissions policy at Harvard, uh, Jared Kushner probably doesn't want to have that happen, uh, but uh, all suggest that we're heading down a very bad path on that front. Uh, Jamel, I'm going to see if I can get you an invitation to Ben Carson's Thanksgiving dinner so that you can have the same experience <laughs> with wacky relatives that the rest of us uh, have had. And I, I do want to mention one thing that we haven't talked about, and that is the false equivalence problem that I think is really still journalists continue to grapple with. And I've gotten enormous pushback from many and continue to that we're here to report both sides of the story, even when there aren't two sides to a story. And sometimes there's one side and sometimes there are 20 sides. And this is such a deeply ingrained value in journalism, along with covering people the way you always cover them, that I think creates this uh, enormous challenge. And finally, one other comment. There was a story today that really struck me. It was out of Detroit. It was about a 14-year-old kid who missed a bus and didn't have a cell phone and was trying to get to high school and knocked on a door and it was a black kid and the woman shouted, what are you doing at my door? And then her husband, a retired firefighter, came out with a shotgun and shot at him and only because he didn't get the safety right uh, that he missed. And you know he's now in jail and I think they will put him away for a long time. This is one of the good guys with guns that we've been talking about. Um, but you know, this 14-year-old geeky kid from a good family knocks on a door, and I see a story about this family. And I don't see a lot of stories about families like that. Uh, and I do think that uh, Jamel has hit on a very important point. We are super focused on Trump voters and why people voted for Trump. And the op-ed page of the Times has had, you know, story after story and takeout after takeout on them and many, many fewer stories about the difficulties and pathologies that hit other communities, and it only happens when somebody gets shot or shot at. And that is something we really all have to worry about, and people in journalism, I think, have to worry about it much, much more. So, questions or comments? Yes. I 
forget. <laughs> OK, so you know, I, one of the things that your comments made me, I mean, I thought a lot of things. But one of the things I thought was how uh, struck I've been by not just by this last two days and what's come up, but in general the last few months, uh, by how popular empathy suddenly is, right? <laughs> suddenly, like, it's all about empathy. It's about understanding people who are different than you, reaching across the aisle. Don't caricature them. Don't talk down to them. And there's this real, like, push to, to think about what <laughs> Trump voters' experiences must be like. What has driven them to, to making the political decisions they're making? And there's something about it that resonates, uh, of course, in a, sort of, on a human level. But there's also something about it that really irks me. Um, and I think that you sort of, when you described, you know, the difference in sort of why, why we may, depending on our life perspectives, be more inclined toward suddenly caring about empathy. Because my mother or my cousin or my brother or somebody I love or somebody who I grew up with might be one of those people. And suddenly I want to try to understand that. Why? Well, uh, there's a, a kind of homophily underlying that is because they're more like me. And so if there seems to be something horrible going on with them, there must be an explanation, right? And I think that that's, that can produce good, right? It means we're looking for and trying to understand people. But it also produces this odd um, or this, I think at times, perverse um, call for empathy that's one directional, right? And I, I teach a class at Cornell on incarceration. And we were talking uh, this week about the racial empathy gap, right? And how actually, when it comes to a lack of empathy, the problem, as far as social psychologists have identified it, is not in the direction of not having empathy for Trump voter-like people, but in the direction of not understanding these other kinds of experiences that happen. So I think this is important. But I worry about your, um, your proposed solution, which is that we need to have more journalists of color, not because I'm not 100% behind that. But because I think two things is one, what does it mean for journal and it's appropriate that I ask you for journalists of color to bear this burden of saying actually no, there are some yeah. things about these folks that 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 we shouldn't be thinking about through the lens of empathy and let's go ahead and do that right. So what kind of target does that put on people of color's back? And it's the same story of people of color save us right, despite all of the barriers that we erect to make your life difficult. I just feel sort of skeptical of that being the answer. And I think it's part of the answer, but why isn't part of the answer also to hold white reporters accountable for how it is that they're responding? Um, and then the other part of this is, as journalists of color become more prominent, might that not sort of reinforce some of these other problems that we've been hearing in terms of a lack of trust in the media, right? So if there are these, these racial divisions and gaps, and suddenly we're hearing from journalists of color, and what they're telling us sounds like it's critical of people who we might not feel comfortable, we as in mainstream Americans, might not feel comfortable being critical of. That could create some pretty perverse mm -hmm. patterns that I would worry then journalists of color and people of color more broadly would be caught in the crosshairs there. Uh, OK, so that's yeah. one. This one is much more quick for Gretchen. Quick. I promise, yes. very quick. So. You point out, I think, really important things that we should be aware of, right? My question is, you know, being aware of these patterns is one thing. Responding to them is what worries me. Because if responding means capitulating, I'm concerned. And because, you, you know, there are times when we might not want to be neutral or even be perceived as neutral, right? Because being neutral in the face of things that are not right isn't good. And so this fear that we're going to lose our, neut our, our neutral ground at, in terms of higher education is, I don't know that I, that's the ground that we should always be on. So that's it, sorry, long. So responses? Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't disagree at all that it is frankly unfair that the burden here falls on journalists of color. Um, uh, I do think that there should be an effort to hold white journalists accountable when um, I think their coverage uh, does what we're describing, um, but for for the short term at least, you know, newsrooms are very white, <laughs> um, and a lot, quite a few of the uh, journalists of color in these newsrooms do have um, concerns about this, do have an eye towards this, and want to write about it and cover it. And so, in the short term, I think it does just end up being our our burden to bear. Um, although that is, I agree. 
uh, not ideal. I also, again, I, I like I disagree with nothing you've said because it's just it's it's I don't, I don't think there's a way to to get around um, the fact that an increased prominent the increased prominence or an increased prominence of journalists of color is will, will almost certainly undermine trust in the media even further. Um, in the same way that the elevation of politicians of color has one effect of undermining trust in institutions among some uh, uh, white Americans. Um, uh, that is a problem I do not know how you get around. Um, but I, I do think that uh, the, the other live option here, which is simply to kind of um, treat sort of uh, ethno-nationalist back backlash among whites as kind of just like a thing about politics that happens and we don't need to examine it too closely outside of sort of particular areas um, is not helpful either. Um, I think there's, 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 there's two kind of not great choices here. Um, and I, I think for, for me personally, I'd rather deal with the downsides of, uh, of elevating journalists of color and bring maybe more critical eye to these communities than deal with the potential downsides of simply um, uh, treating these sorts of backlashes as in some way understandable or kind of just like a natural part um, of politics. And the first part of your question was like, involved just like how does it feel to have a target on your back? It doesn't feel great. Uh, uh, it doesn't feel great. I would love to compare hate mail um, with you just because uh, my hate mail is not, not, not good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's hate mail that's like, I disagree with you very strongly. I think you are paid by George Soros, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's hate mail that's like, oh, there's like a racial slur in my inbox, and it kind of just like goes on from there. Um, and uh, I think actually this is a problem. This is something that news organizations um, understand is a thing, that being um, a journalist of color, uh, being a woman journalist for that matter, exposes you to a level of vitriol um, that uh, that white journalists or, or male journalists don't simply get, and it's a thing that needs to be dealt with and, and addressed. So quickly on the, on your question about higher education, um, there the response to the critique. I think there are elements of of the critiques that I talked about that. Uh, it makes sense for us to pay attention to. I think things like costs, for instance, are things that we ought to be paying attention to. Uh, there are other elements that I think we should be very firmly pushing back on, but I think we need to be aware of them in order to push back on them in a thoughtful way that doesn't shut down conversation. On this issue of neutrality, I, I am not saying that uh, academics should be neutral in the sense of not having informed opinions about things. Uh, I think that we ought to be more open about how we produce knowledge and what it takes to produce knowledge and how we test that, among other things, so that people can judge. I also think it's fair for people to say that we are not as politically or philosophically diverse a group as we ought to be and that that's uh, something that we ought to be spending some time addressing. Peter. You know, um, I'm so glad that you're from Albury is here. Every time I go to the Detroit site, I always put that kid uh, pieces first. And I think one of the qualities that your pieces have might be relevant to this conversation we're having about situating uh, ethno-nationalists and racists you usually speak from a somewhat more holistic and distanced perspective. Um, and I think that uh, sometimes that's missing in the more human interest accounts that are uh, pr produced about particular people, um, both in uh, journalism and in academia. But I want to say that my, at least in the, I, I'll trust you for the journalistic world, but I have to say in the academic world, um, the people who denounce me regularly when I suggest that most Tea Party people are actually, and I, I'm talking to organized leaders, but are, you know, they're ethno-nationalists. <laughs> they're proudly ethno-nationalists. Uh, the ones who denounce me are the ones who've never talked to anybody uh, and don't have anybody in their family. Um, 
And my West Virginia relatives, who are uh, probably the only white liberals in the business community in West Virginia, are absolutely scathing about the racists in their networks and their friends. They don't, they don't pussyfoot around. They don't try to uh, uh, undercut it. In fact, I, my experience of, 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 of poorer people of all colors is that they're often quite frank about their cousin. So I'm a little skeptical that it's having a, that it's a, understanding a person as somebody that you might in other circumstances have to deal with or even love um, stands in the way of understanding that they're racist. I think it could be, sometimes it's quite refreshing and at least in academia, everybody I know who thinks Tea Party years are just frustrated leftists are people who've never talked to a Tea Party year. <laughs> and for uh, Gretchen, I'm gonna be quick, but I, yeah, I agree with everything you've said about the things we need to be aware of, but to the degree that you are suggesting that academic administrators, even in public universities, should go down the road of practicing ideological affirmative action, I have to say there is nothing that will be more destructive than that. And the attacks that are coming are not from ordinary people. The, the, including conservative people. The, um, the, they are orchestrated and they are deliberate and they are intended to arouse really stupid responses from academic administrators and they often do, actually. I'm not talking about you, but they, they do. Uh, so, you know, I think that uh, uh, there's research that shows that academics have actually not moved that much in their views of the substance of policies. What has moved is the right in this country. And I always make a distinction when I'm talking in, in research contexts with students or with anyone else. I say, this is what I believe as a citizen. I have the same right as everybody to believe something as a citizen. And here's what I do as a researcher and a teacher where I need to be open and balanced and objective in my presentation. And most people understand that distinction. Well, the, the Coke Network is actually a part of what you're talking about. Uh, this young, this young lady in the back, and then this young man, right here. Thank you. I thought this was a really interesting panel. Uh, I guess what I'd like to hear from any of the panelists who wanted to jump in is a little more. You know, we hear in a, a lot about poor white Trump voters, um, but of course there were many rich white Trump voters, and I think that that's. Mo I mean, and yeah, exactly. So the. Um, you know, there isn't within, among white people, there was not a strong correlation between income and Trump voting. And so, so to follow up on what Jamel said, uh, which I 100% agreed with, I think there's also an element of if, if Trump voters can be them, that is say poor white people, it must not be us, right? Uh, middle, upper middle class white people, right? So I think that that's also a distinction. But I'd love to know more about if work has been done, because I'm not uh, looking at sort of in the sort of ethnographic or almost anthropological way that that poor white Trump voters get assessed. Is there any work in that regard for wealthy uh, Trump, but white Trump voters? Let's, uh, actually, let me take this uh, other question and then we can wrap up. Thank you. Uh, One of the things that happened in 2016 is that no major newspaper endorsed Donald Trump, uh, with possibly two exceptions. And I'm just wondering, just as a factual matter, what happened to those, the circulations of those newspapers or the, um, the s support for them in their cities and towns, if you know. So I don't know if there's a study about that. So any responses to? On the point of the on the point of yeah. the uh, richer, tr uh, the the uh, m more affluent Trump voters, um, you know, Republican voters. I mean, I mean, um, I feel like there was. I guess there was some work on, I mean, Theta probably knows better um, than I do on this. I mean, definitely, I mean, my my uh, Rittman, Ohio lady, you know, it was her uncle who, like, was the bi a business owner in quite a successful landscaping business who was, like, the real kind of Trump. He had the big sign. He was the real kind of, like, yeah. So he was a diehard, and she was sort of like, eh, I voted for the guy, but I kind of am not happy about it. And her mother, who's the eight buck and fifty dollar, eight eight fifty an hour, Lady at Burger King, but for Hillary, so you know. But, but there was some. Um, yeah, it's not like or the post. Somebody had some uh, demographic median income. You know, the median income of Trump of a typical 
primary Trump voter as opposed to just like a Republican voter who voted Republican Neil in the general was like, you know, higher than you know, higher than medium or something. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. so yeah. Um, but you know, you, I don't know. It's it's um, it's um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I think I've seen that kind of analytical work done, um, and during the primaries too, sort of trying to find distinctions between Trump supporters and, and the rest of the primary field. Um, I don't think I've seen any more any like very many soft focus profiles of um, of uh, of those voters. I saw one. Uh, it was I forgot who wrote it, but it, it was of a family in Pittsburgh, and it was it was done in the style of these are poor white Trump voters, but then when you read carefully, you're like, oh, these are like affluent people mm -hmm. who have like working class affect, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and as sort of a separate separate from all of this, I think one sort of analytical problem I've seen just sort of among kind of uh, uh, journalists and, and, and lay observers and such is a conflation of like class status and affect, right? Well, sort of like- income and formal education. Right. Right, yeah. right. And so I, I, I have seen quite a bit of, you know, uh, Trump supporters are, you know, blue collar working class people, but being blue collar doesn't necessarily mean you are working class. I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Many of my neighbors in my neighborhood were uh, contractors, independent business owners who were white and affluent or upper middle class or solidly middle class. Um, but uh, if you would have like looked at them on the street, you would have been like, oh, that must be a working class guy. Look, the makers-takers uh, dichotomy is a really important one here. You talk to a lot of these uh, more well-to-do people, and there's an enormous uh, uh, antipathy towards people that they see as taking from the society while they're the ones who are giving to the society. Hey, Norm, can I just yeah, say of course. One, one thing, and it's just to echo what Gretchen said, is thank you to the organizers. This has been a really terrific... I was here yesterday and, and saw a part of today and is really grateful to... My friend Suzanne Mettler and, and Rick and Lee and, and Mark and Daniel uh, supporting us all. Uh, it was just a, a terrific idea for a conference, and I learned a lot. That's a good place to uh, end. Thank you all.